Good morning. All right, A Generous Life, a new series, a mini-series, two back-to-back mini-series. I'm excited about it. Um, I will make up for it later this year because I've been praying through this series that we'll do that won't be a mini-series. It'll be a mega-series. It's going to be very long, um, kind of like mini world changers, mega world changers. Um, but yeah, we're, we're praying through a book of the Bible I think we want to teach through. I won't spoil it yet because we're still... Still praying about it, but it'll be great. But this week, we are starting a mini-series called The Generous Life, and I am excited about it because who doesn't want to be generous? If we walked out and we were asking you on the way out, hey, do you want to be generous? I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's one of you in here, but you'd be like, who'd be like, I don't want to be generous. Everybody wants to be generous. Everybody wants to live a generous life. We know God blesses it. We know that it's his best for us. It's know what, what he desires for us. We all have some level. There's not too many Ebenezer Scrooges walking around who just have zero desire to be generous. Um, but I think there's sometimes things that get in our way. I think there's things that, that are roadblocks to our generosity. And I think as Christians especially, that desire gets implanted in us, and we know it's God's heart and God's best for us. And uh, I was th- reflecting on it, and I think there's two primary things that get in our way, two things that I hear from people and two things that, that I, I see in Scripture. And the first is that we think we can't on a practical level. We don't think we can be generous. With our finances, we're just like, I just can't. There's just, it's just not possible right now. And the second thing is we get distracted on a heart level. The first one, we think we can't practically. And the second one is we get distracted spiritually. Other things just take precedence. It's not like we mean to. It's not like we'd actually say they're more important. They just have become more important or become more urgent or they've crept in and we think we can't. I would if I could. I don't know if you've ever said that. I've said that before. I would if I could. We think we can't. Things are tight right now. Maybe when I make more, I can give more. When I'm done with that project, when I get that job, when I'm done with school, when I get that promotion, or when I'm in the the field that I want to be in, or when school's paid off, or whatever the next thing is, or we get distracted. We we know if we've been around church for a while or read through the Bible, there's, there's multiple passages that connect our heart and our finances. And Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, talks about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And they kind of follow each other around. Have you noticed that? You put your money somewhere, your heart follows it. I never cared about that before, but I invested stock in them, now I care about them a lot. Or vice versa, your, your heart's somewhere and your, your finances naturally follow it. They're, they're tethered together. And so sometimes our generosity is we think we can't practically, or our heart has drifted. Well, Proverbs 11.24 says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. I like this other translation says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger. It keeps getting bigger. But the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I was reading about this and studying, and there's so many, there's over 2,500 passages in Scripture that deal with your finances. That's so many. It's five times more than faith, five times more than prayer. It's a lot. It's something that matters to the heart of God. And in fact, it's something that pastors are commanded to talk about. 1 Timothy 6, 17 uh, says, command those who are rich. 1 Timothy, for those who don't know, is a, is a letter to a young pastor. Paul is, is a seasoned pastor and church planner, and he's writing it to a younger pastor and encouraging him, and he's trained him, and he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, which I think is a great reminder. We, we hang on to finances because we, we think it's going to provide some sort of security, some sort of control, but really there's a lot of uncertainty that still exists, as many of us know. But then he says, command those who are rich to put their hope in God. That's the opposite. He says, put their hope in God, which rich, who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Paul's like, hey, this is actually something you have to do. You need to remind people to be generous, to take hold of what is truly life. Look at this, verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is my my heart for you, that you would experience life that is truly life, that you would experience the generous life, that you experience the blessings that come with it, the favor of God that comes with it, the the treasures stored up in heaven that comes with it. So we're going to spend a few weeks talking about it. We're going to spend a few weeks talking about how do I live a generous life? What practical steps do I take? What what are some of those 2,500 verses? We're going to go through all of them. No, I'm just kidding. We'll go through a handful. Um, 
Because I want that for us. I want your heart to be free. And I think sometimes we, we get a little tense when we think about money in church. And we're like, either think it's because the church is going to teach us that it's bad to have money, which that is not what we're teaching. It's not bad to have money. Money is not bad. The, ro- the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. I want you to actually have money. I think it's really good. Hopefully you have some. Hopefully you get more. I'm actually going to talk about that at the end of the message, how to get more. Um, I want that for you. But also, I want us to have the freedom to know that this isn't even about that. It's about your heart. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not promoting poverty or, or pushing prosperity. I'm fighting idolatry. That's really the heart behind this message. Is I think this is one of the biggest things that can creep in to be an idol in our life. It's not even just a one-time thing like, hey, I fought that battle, I'm done, I'm good forever. It creeps back in. It's something that we have to be vigilant about. So I want to give us four things today, not about generosity, but about our practical finances. Because before we get to what is God calling us to do, how do we give, all of those things, is tithing biblical, is that just Old Testament, is it New Testament? We're going to talk about some of that stuff and, and get into it. But first, I just want to talk about the other 90. The other 90. That's the title of today's message. The other 90. What do you do with what you already have? The part that God's called you to, to steward and manage yourself. And so I have four quick things. The first one is budget. Budget. Did you guys know budgeting is kind of biblical? It's not like you have to. It's not like if you don't, it's a sin. But I think it's spiritual. I think you should have one. I think God cares about it. I was reading this week, and I've never preached from this verse ever. It's from Proverbs, and I love preaching Proverbs, these principles that God has. It's from Proverbs 27. It says this in verse 23, know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for uh, your herds. Put your heart into caring for your herds. It's an interesting verse, right? Know the state of your flocks. It's like, well, who has sheep? None of us. But look, the writer of Proverbs actually connects it to our riches. He says, for riches don't last forever and the crown might not be passed on to the next generation. After the hay is harvested and the new crop appears, the mountain grasses are gathered in. Your sheep will provide wool for clothing and goats will provide the price of a field. And you will have enough goat's milk for yourself, your family, and your servant girls. It's a different culture, right? We don't have servants. We don't have sheep. We're living in a different time period. But what the point of this is, what what the writer is trying to convey and the principle behind it is manage what you have. Know the state of your flocks. Your flocks would have been your wealth. That would have been how rich you are. How many sheep do you have? How many goats do you have? How much of this? That's how wealthy we knew a person was. In the Old Testament, it would talk about the wealth of David or the wealth of Solomon, and it would talk about how many herds they had, or, or Jacob or Abraham. All these Old Testament fathers would be like, and they had so many. And it says, know the state of your flocks. That's like, know what's going on financially. Like, know how much you have. Know where it's going so that it doesn't wander off. Because sometimes sheep wander away. And sometimes our finances disappear and we're like, where did it go? Do we know where it is? Do we have a plan? So have a budget. You, you have to know where your money's going and prioritize it. Have a plan for giving and saving and housing and food and transportation and all of those things. It's boring. I'm not going to get super into it. Hopefully you know how to budget. Maybe you don't, though. If you don't, there's great resources. And I'd love to, like, send me a text, send me an email, talk to me after service. I can point you to some great websites, some great resources or books to help you get started on a basic budget. The, the question is, are you stressed about money? Because here, here's a little formula. When you spend more than you make, you will be stressed. <laughs> it's pretty simple, right? When you spend more than you make, you're going to be stressed. You're going to go further into debt. You're going to be stretched too thin. You're not going to be able to do the things right. Maybe, maybe the priorities got out of balance. But when you spend less than you make, it's freedom. When you spend less than you make, you're financially free. You have margin. And why freedom? Freedom, when you spend more than you make, it's not just stressful. It's actually bondage. It's actually tying you up. You're committed to things that you're stuck in and you can't get out of it. And the, the Bible uses a lot of language of master when it comes to finances. You can't serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And so what happens is we actually end up becoming a servant to our money, which kind of leads us to our second point. Before you put it on the screen, it's a four-letter word. It's a bad word. It's a bad four-letter word. That word is debt. (laughs) The Bible talks a lot about debt. Abigail just rolled her eyes. She didn't know know that that was in the sermon. But um, debt, 
Debt is something the Bible talks about a lot. And again, it's not something that's a, necessarily a sin issue. And if, if you're in debt, I mean, pretty much everybody is in debt is what studies show. But the Bible never talks positively about it. It's never like, hey, you should do that. Like, it's a great idea or anything like that. And in fact, it says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. There's no positive parts of scripture that's like, debt works so well. SNL had a skit a while back and um, Amy Poehler is there and uh, what's the other guy's name? He's white hair. He's father of the bride guy. Steve Martin. Martin. There you go. You guys all knew. But I don't know if you've ever seen this skit. If not, Google it after church, not during church. Google it after church and um, just type in SNL money skit and it'll come up. And basically the whole thing for three minutes is them being like, don't spend money you don't have. And it's comical. And you guys laughed when I gave you that formula. But we all do it. So often we spend money we don't have yet because we're just tempted by that thing. That thing in front of us, that, that car that's a little bit nicer or that house or this other thing. And I think it's okay to go into debt for a house. I don't, I'm not saying that. Most of us need a mortgage. Um, but other than that, we have so many things. Car payments, the average car payment for a new car is $700. The average car payment for a used car right now is $525 and some odd change. That's so much money. But a lot, a lot of us have done that. We've done it or we've done something else. We've put it on the credit card. It's something we want. We've just, we've just decided that it's worth it. And so what I want for you really, really practically, but still spiritual, is practice delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is a kingdom principle. He, Jesus is trying to get us to delay it way farther. Practically, at least for your debt, delay it a little bit. Wait till you have the money before you make the purchase. But Jesus is saying, hey, don't just store up treasures even on this earth. Store it up in the next life. Focus on what matters most, that spiritual principle of delayed gratification. The average person, 18 to 29, has $11,737 of debt. 30 to 39, 23584 40 to 49, goes up a little bit more, 24404 This is not counting mortgages. This is just... Credit cards, cars, all that stuff, furniture. I, <laughs> I had a friend who was telling me that he financed a futon. And I was like, that, a futon? That's not even worth buying if you had the money. <laughs> like, <laughs> 50 to 59, you have $21,481 of debt. 60 to 69, it goes back down, 15519 It's a lot of money. I just want to encourage you, like, as, as Christians, the Bible talks about avoiding debt. Again, it's not, it's not salvation. It's not sin. It's just wise. Don't be in debt. Because it's hard to have God be your master and your priority and, have him, and be able to come to him and say, God, what do you want me to do with what I have when it's already tied up going to somebody else? When you're already in bondage, when you're already slave to the lender. Have a plan. Make a plan today, this week, to get out of debt. All right, the first one. This is a good four-letter word. Save. Save. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Don't just have a revolving door. Have you noticed that? Is your, are your finances a revolving door? Are you living paycheck to paycheck? The average person does live paycheck to paycheck. But what's interesting is you've been living to paycheck to paycheck for the last four or five raises, the last two, three jobs, and I know things change and inflation goes up or you have more kids and expenses go up. But we just have a way of spending what we have. It's just human nature. We just, we just find a good use for it. We spend more than we have. And so thinking about what we just talked about, the average car monthly payment, I just want to talk about interest for a second. Interest is huge, both negatively and positively. The average car monthly payment, like I said, $525. That's for a used car. If you invested $500, we'll round down, a month for the length of your career, for like 40 years, that's well over $3 million that you'll have at retirement. That's, that's if you do the opposite of spending what you don't have. If you save what you do have, put away $500. I know most of us can't put away $500. Some of you can. Start with something. Start with what you do have. Start with that little bit. Did you know of over that $3.3 million, and that's like a conservative return rate that's based on averages over those 40 years. The 3 million is what you made in interest. The 0.3, the 300 and something thousand is what you actually put in. That's insane. 
That's so much money. And if you think about that debt versus saving, you're giving that money to somebody else, the banks, the car loan people, all of them, or you're saving it up for yourself. It's not bad to save money. It's good. It's a great biblical principle. The wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Don't spend everything that comes in. And it comes down to this, which is my fourth point and the longest point. All three of those things fall under the category of stewardship. Stewardship. It's not a word we talk about a lot. It's, a, it's a kind of a bible word. We do use it in normal culture, but it's the idea of managing what you have. It's looking over and taking care of something else. And I want to read this story that Jesus tells. It's in Matthew 25. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. Depending on your translation, it might say five talents. A talent is not just a skill or a gift. That's what it means in our language. A talent would have been a form of uh, weight, uh, the heaviest form. So they, they did currency by weights. Uh, shekel, uh, mina, all of those things were different measurements of weight. And this was the biggest. The talent was the largest amount. And we don't know for sure if it was gold or silver, what the parable that Jesus is telling is referring to, but it's a lot of money. I mean, here's the quick stats. One talent is roughly 60-something pounds. There's different people who say it's different amounts. Um, and so in average, if it was just average, we didn't know if it was gold, silver, bronze, or whatever, it's $200,000 currently. So he's giving them that five times, a million dollars. If it was gold, it's much, much more than that. It's over a million dollars just for one talent. So, th- so Jesus is saying in this story, he's coming and he gave him five bags of gold. To another, he gave two bags. And to another, one bag, each according to his ability. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. That's a great return, 100%. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought out the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. Think about that word for a second, entrusted. It wasn't his. He had had the revelation that this wasn't his money to start with in the first place. And his master replied in verse 21, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and see, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put money on a deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I could have received it back with interest. He's like, you could have at least done the minimum. Instead of hiding it, like, go put it in the bank. So the bag of gold, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. There will be weeping where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a parable of Jesus. Jesus is teaching and he's saying, hey, here's the story. Three guys, five, two, one, the first two double it. The last guy comes back just with what I gave him. And each time, he has a different response. The first two, he says, well done, my good and what servant? Faithful. Faithful. What God is looking for in our stewardship is faithfulness. What have you done with what you have? This principle can apply to much more than money, but it does apply to our money. Are you doing God's best with what you have? Are you wasting it? Are you using it? Are you increasing it? Are you bringing it back to him? Is it pleasing to him? 
asking questions, saying, what is the state of my flock? If my dollar bills are what God has entrusted me, am I caring for it? Or is it wandering off carelessly? Or am I just, you know, that doesn't really matter? Or all these different things. Are we stewarding what God has given us? Are you, entrust, are you trustworthy? Are you faithful? What about some of those other things besides money? How, how are you being faithful with, with your child? or with your job, or with your coworker, or with your spouse? Are you stewarding it well? I mentioned earlier I was going to talk a little bit about how to make more money. I think this is a great principle to make more money. I have yet to meet somebody who's, who's stewarding and being faithful in the position they are in and doing their absolute best who doesn't eventually get promoted or find another opportunity or get moved up. I, I hear story after story. There was a guy, I watched a video Earlier this week, one of my friend's churches, and a guy from his church, he talked about how he got a job he was never even qualified for just because he was so faithful doing the last job. He would just do it 100%, do his absolute best. God, you've given this to me, I'm going to steward it well, and he just kept leading to more. None of us are going to give more to somebody who's not doing well, even from a practical level. If you are a boss, if you have employees, or if you have kids, if, if you notice that your kids are not taking care of things well, you're not going to let them do it. Right? I have a couple things, very few things, that I'm like, no, you can't use that to my kids. And the only reason is I don't trust that they're going to be faithful with it. I'm worried they're going to break it. I'm worried that it's not going to get returned to me or it's going to be, you know, broken or lost or any of those things. And it's not that I don't trust them or love them. It's just that they haven't grown to the place yet. And so in this story, it says, as they have ability, according to their ability. And if you want to increase what God is giving you, increase your ability. Invest in yourself. God, can I steward this job better? Can I steward this thing better? Can I steward this relationship better? And watch him give you more. When, you let, when he's, you're trustworthy with a little bit, he you can trust you with more. Luke 16, 11 says, So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, actual possessions, who will trust you with true riches? Jesus is making it spiritual here. This is a different teaching of Jesus and money. He's saying, hey, if, if I can't trust you to be faithful with what you have actually practically, but you want, you want more influence spiritually, do you, want, you want to do that or, or lead this group or do that thing. He's like, but, but are you being faithful with the little thing right in front of you? He's looking for trustworthiness, faithfulness across the board in every area of our life. Favor is a product of faithfulness. I think sometimes we're like, God, I just need your favor in my finances, or I need your favor in this relationship, or I need your favor in my marriage, or I need your favor at work. We need God's favor in all these areas. And favor is not something you can earn, earn, but faithfulness often invites the favor of God. When he sees that you're trustworthy in that area, he blesses you. He knows he can trust you with more. When he sees that, that your heart's not connected to it, but that your heart is in it, that you love it and you're stewarding it well, he trusts you with more according to their ability, according to what they could carry. I want, you to, I want to encourage you to increase your capacity. If you want God to trust you with more, show that you're faithful with what you have in whatever area of your life, bigger than finances right now. How do I, going back to the beginning, those two things, things that stop us from a generous life, we think we can't. And I think some of that comes down to stewardship. I think you can most of us, almost everybody in the room, could. I'm, I'm convicted thinking about a story of when we first planted the church. There was somebody here who, in my eyes, had no reason to give. They didn't have a job. They were currently without a place to live, all of those things. And they came, and they put $2 in the offering. And they told us about how much money they had, where it came from, what happened that week. And it was more than a tithe for them. And that story regularly breaks me because it's like Jesus and the, the story of the woman who gave the two cents. He's like, you see those guys writing those giant checks and giving all of this? And generosity is not about the amount. It's about our heart and what we have and what we're doing with what we have. Because Jesus talks about the Pharisees coming in and wanting people to see and notice what they're giving and what they're doing. And this woman comes in and puts in the two cents and he's like, that's all she has. And there's parts that, that stretch me. Can, can I do 
what you're asking me to do, beyond what I view as the minimum and beyond what I'm currently doing, God, can I, can I do more? And, you know, that we think we can't on a practical level is often just an excuse for the second point. When we say, God, we, we can't be generous right now because X, Y, and Z or this thing or that thing. Maybe, maybe you are in a little bit of bondage because of debt you're in and things like that. But a lot of times that is just an excuse for the second part is our heart. We're distracted. We've just made other things more important. We, we've put a higher value on, on things than maybe we should have. Or, you know, do we really need that? We say, oh, yeah, I need a reliable car, but do you need that car? This is a reliable car that's cheaper than that. Or, you know, and I'm not saying start judging other people. I'm saying look at yourself. God, what am I doing with what I have? Am I being faithful? And this is how I personally fight to have a generous heart. Because generosity is a value of mine. It's a value of the churches. It's something that I've lived by. I, I think about this and, you know, if I look at just the last 10 years, I've been, I've been giving for more than 10 years and I've never given less than 10% in the last 10 years we've actually almost always given more. And I don't say that as a point to look at us. I say that as a point of just, that is a way we guard our heart, is we give a lot away. And if I think about that, I'm like, okay, but over the course of 10 years, that means if I averaged out how much I made over the 10 years, I've given away over what I made in one year. And if I think about that with interest, I'm like, oh, that could be so much. We could be in a different financial situation, but I have zero regret. I have zero regret about it. Because my heart is so much softer because of it. And not only that, I think it's obedience to God. So when I, when I want to fight to be generous, the first thing I do is make sure I'm giving regularly. The second thing I do is making sure I steward what I have. Like have some form of budget. Have some account of the flock and the herd that God has given you. Make sure you know where things are going. The second is get out and stay out of debt. The best you can, get out and stay out of debt. And the fourth is seek God more than money. It's not bad to want money. It's bad to want money more than God. It's bad to want what he can give you more than him himself. Think about this as a parent. If you were to give your kid a gift because you love them so much, you gave them that special thing on Christmas, they got a brand new video game console, and all of a sudden that thing that was meant to be a gift is now hindering your relationship with that kid because they never pay attention to you anymore and they just care about that, you would be like, I'm not going to give them more. I don't even know if I'm going to let them keep that. I think we're going to sell that thing because I care more about this relationship than that. And it's not that you don't want to give them good things. You just don't want it to get out of priority. And God wants you. He's not just after your stuff. I think sometimes we're worried, God just wants my stuff. He doesn't need your money. The church doesn't even need your money. Will we use it and steward it well? And will God use it to reach more people? I absolutely believe so. But we're also going to keep doing what we're called to do no matter what. And so with that, seek God more than stuff. Regularly have that time with God. God, have I just gotten things out of balance? Is there something that matters too much to me? I think that as we do that, we're going to start to see personal revival. I've been reflecting on that this week, and many of you know, but maybe not everybody, there's, there's kind of a revival going on at Asbury um, a college in Kentucky, and it's been really cool to watch. I've had multiple friends who went there and love hearing what they're like. One of our friends uh, is, a, is a pastor, and he flew there with his teenage daughter, and he was like, man, it's just an atmosphere of repentance and renewal, and it's so sweet and so genuine um, and just really encouraging. And, you know, that kind of stuff gets me so excited. It's like God is moving. And I even had a moment this week where I was like, you know, we'd been praying about this for a long time. We really felt God was like, you, you need to talk about finances. And it's not my favorite thing to talk about. I do it. I think it's biblical. Like, like I said, First Timothy, he's like, command them to be generous. But I'm like, God, should we just pause it? And should we talk about worship? And should we talk about repentance and revival? And, and God was like, no, 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 no. The, this is what you need to talk about. Because I think for a lot of us, we're not going to experience that personal revival because this is such an idol in our life. M it's just something that we've, we've put on a pedestal. We, we don't live a generous life, and it's because we care more about living a comfortable life than we do actually about pursuing God radically. I mean, Jesus told the rich young ruler this, this story. He's like, what must, I, what must I do to be saved? He's like, follow the law. And he's like, I do that. He's like, what else? He's like, sell all your stuff. And he's like, no, I can't do it. He walked away. 
I think how many of us are like that? And I don't think Jesus literally wants all of us to sell all of our stuff. The point is Jesus is saying, hey, you're not actually all in. Do I have your heart if I don't have your stuff? I mean, I think if, if I had a relationship with Abigail, which I do, we're madly in love. We just finished a series on relationships. But I was like, hey, you know, like, we're good, but none of you can't, you don't have access to my stuff. You'd be like, what? That's not a relationship. That's not, you don't actually love her. How much more God who lovingly gave us everything, laid down his life, sent his own son when we didn't deserve it. Do we freely surrender and say, God, whatever, whatever you want me to do is yours. I'm just a steward. This is your stuff. This is your life. I'm yours now. I'm going to live for you and you alone. Ephesians chapter 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. All of us have been dead spiritually because we've gone our own way. We've decided to, to do things our way instead of God's. We've fallen short of his standards. And then in verse 3, it says, Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Just we deserved punishment. Like we didn't do things God's way, we deserved punishment. But verse 4, But because of his great love for us, you got to love a good but in Scripture. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy... He's rich in mercy. He has so much of it, an abundance of it. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. We're generous because God's generous towards us. He loves us freely. He provides for us. It says in Timothy when it talks about generosity that God wants you to have things and enjoy them. Going back to that verse earlier, he's like, command them to be generous and to share. He's like, because God wants them to enjoy life. And it seems like, well, when I'm giving stuff away, how am I enjoying life? God will bless you. I don't know if that always means financially repaying you, but I know that it means it, that he will fill you with his spirit, that he will pour out blessing on you. And that, that it's our natural response to say, God, everything I have is yours. So as we start this series on generosity, we didn't even get to talk about what God calls us to do and being generous or any of those things, but I just want us to remind us to, to be a good steward of what we already have, to the part that is ours, that God tells us to keep as our own, the other 90, and, and just, God, would you help us to, to get out of debt, to save, and to be free to live the life generously that you call us to do? And so I want to first, as we end this, this first part of the series, just Give that invitation we always give. Have you received God's generosity towards you? And that while you were dead to sin, deserving of wrath, like we all were, he poured out his grace and mercy. And all you have to do is receive that as a free gift. That God, you gave this free gift to me and I receive it. I want to walk in it. And now I'm yours. I'm following after you. If that's you this morning, I just want you to pray with me and and pray these in your own words, in your own mind. God, I need you. I I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve relationship with you. I don't deserve any of that. But because you love me, because of your rich mercy and grace towards me, Jesus came and died for me and rose again on the third day. So God, I thank you for that. I receive that grace and forgiveness this morning as a free gift. And I offer my life back to you as a living sacrifice. Everything I have is yours. Would you fill me with your spirit and make me brand new? In Jesus' name, amen. For all of us who've already made that decision, which I know is most of us in the room, we're followers of Jesus. I think, I think this can be so easily an idol in our life. No matter how generous we are, no matter how much we are following God's standards, it can still creep in and 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 tempt our hearts. So I just want to have that same moment for us, that coming to Jesus and saying, God, everything I have is yours. Nothing is off limits. So God, we come before you and lay our lives down once again because you laid down your life for us. God, we say nothing is off limits. Here I am. Lord, if you want to send me to the mission field, send me to the mission field. God, if you you want me to change the way I'm stewarding my finances, would I do that? God, if you, if you want me to parent differently, if you want me to show up at work with a different attitude, God, I will do that. 
God, would we be faithful stewards of the things you've given us, the relationships, the skills, the giftings, the finances. We ask for your help by your spirit in Jesus' name. And God, would we experience a personal revival as we lay down our life, lay down our idols, and come back to you. Would you draw us to worship? Would you draw us to repentance? In Jesus' name, amen.